Hi everyone, this is Toby from the International Association for Political Science Students and we are here again from San Francisco at the annual convention of the International Studies Association. I'm really happy to have next to me on my side right now Robert Kiwain, professor from Princeton. I'm happy to be here. It's a great pleasure. And um, we are here right now to talk about after hegemony, the future of American leadership, but also want to cover um, some more personal um, insights into your career. Right. And um, this is what I also want to start with and ask you, um, after 30, 40 years as an, as an IR researcher being, being in the field, um, when did you realize that you want to go into IR and, and how, how did you realize that? Well, I, I was born in 1941, which means that I, I was a little, a little early, a little precocious. So I was in graduate school in, in the early 60s. I was in graduate school d during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But, so in the late 50s, when I was in, an undergraduate, um, international politics was a very salient set of issues. I know I, I cared about politics. My parents were both political scientists. It's, I wasn't very original in this respect. Uh, they didn't do international politics, but it was, to me, the, the most arresting topic. It was the, it was the era of Sputnik. Uh, Sputnik uh, occurred the, my first week in college. Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, prominence and salience of international relations. I mean, later, if I had been five years younger, uh, I, I was involved in, in the civil rights movement. I might have become a civil rights or domestic politics uh, specialist, but there was a lot of salience in the time I was deciding, which was basically 1959, 1961, what to, what, what to work on, where it looked as if um, international politics was prominent. And as you may remember Kennedy's inaugural address, bear any burden, pay any price. It was almost all focused on the international challenges. And the Berlin Wall came up a little bit later than that. So there was, it was a period of, of dramatic international events, which I think is what attracted me to international politics. Mm -hmm. And how did you um, have your first contact with international relations as a discipline? What were the, the first things that, um, that you wanted to study, that you want to learn about? And was it more an interest to learn more or, or was there a tension that you felt there, there is something that misses in the discipline that you wanted to, to change something? Oh, it started out just, just to learn more. Yeah. I went to graduate school. I didn't know much about international politics. I had a general education, mostly classics, humanities. Uh, humanities. I went to Harvard and, and Stanley Hoffman was my mentor. Uh, Hoffman was a brilliant lecturer. He was, as you know, a European by background. He's very cosmopolitan. He was very interested in the relationship between political theory, classic political theory, Kant or, Kant or, or Hegel or uh, Hobbes, and international politics. He was very, very deeply historical, deeply qualitative. And so uh, I was captured in that orbit, so to speak, for a while. So at first it was just learning more about international politics, being fascinated by the field. Mm -hmm. And then um, you published your, your book about American hegemony and leadership. How did you um, develop the idea and, and what were the main points in that book? Well, we're skipping 20 years real fast here because <laughs> that book was published in 1984 and yeah. I got my PhD in 1966. So, uh, but I'll go back to your earlier question. Mm -hmm. I, I really, like many graduate students, I eventually became critical of the perspective of my teacher. Uh, and I still had tremendous respect for Hoffman. He was a great scholar. Uh, but I, uh, it, you know the famous um, Isaiah Berlin distinction between a hedgehog and a fox in, intellectually. Uh, 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 Berlin says, a fox knows many things. Hedgehog knows one big thing. So Marx, for example, is a hedgehog. Mm -hmm. uh, Hoffman was a fox. He knew lots of little things. He talked about it being a theorist, but he didn't know have a theory because he didn't have any uh, connection between some major set of explanatory variables and uh, and some outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually I, I decided that I was more of a hedgehog mm -hmm. that I wanted to, to, to know at least one big thing about one big problem. And so what really uh, what really affected me was more the work of Kenneth Waltz uh, than of Hoffman. Um, Ken Waltz actually hired me as Swarthmore. Mm -hmm. And he was, as you probably know, the classic realist, uh, rigorous, much more rigorous uh, than most people, logically impeccable, I think, 
uh, very careful uh, in terms of philosophy of science, very much oriented toward a scientific approach. But the conclusions he reached were to me at odds with what I saw in the world. Because Ken was very state centric. He wasn't interested in, in independence, thought it wasn't very important. And he certainly didn't think international institutions were very important. So when you're faced with somebody who is one of the most powerful minds in the field uh, and has a construction which internally is very rigorously done, and yet it reaches a, a conclusion that you think is wrong then you have to search for what's missing in it. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself, what's, is there some assumption? Is there something missing from the theory? And so I struggled for a number of years with that. I was teaching in Stanford, and that was the big, that was after nine, I had done power and independence. I wish you talk about that a minute first, because mm -hmm. power and independence, I think, is one of my more important works, and Joe and I had a completely equal relationship to it, and I learned a tremendous amount from my collaboration with Joe and I on transnational relations and world politics, and then on, but that was, this was more observational. We observed that the world was very different than the realists portrayed it because they weren't talking about interdependence. Mm -hmm. And almost no one was talking about economics. It was all security all, all the time. And that's how I'd been trained, all security all the time at, at Harvard. So that, that was one dimension. You sort of look around and say, well, there's a whole area out here and nobody's talking about it. Let's mm -hmm. theorize. Let's talk about this. Let's theorize it. Let's, let's try to analyze it. And the core of that uh, book is the relationship between asymmetrical interdependence and power. The claim that when there's asymmetrical interdependence, there is a power relationship which is conferred on behalf of the less dependent mm -hmm. uh, partner. You see it right now with the U.S. and China that as Trump is trying to take advantage of. There's not as much asymmetry as he would like, or maybe I would like, between the U.S. and China. Now there was more later, more, more earlier, uh, but the relationship between asymmetric independence and power, which I think Nye and I first identified in the international relations literature. We were working on the base of Hirschman's work, but it was the first international relations work we identified. I think that work is, is something I, I, I'm, I'm proud of. I'll talk about it. I think it, it's still relevant. And the book is still in print. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that that was much more observational. That I don't think there was a that wasn't stimulated by a deep concern about the theory of of international politics. Mm -hmm. But it was Waltz's uh, work. It, it was first in an article in 1975, and then remember his book is called is not called a theory of international. It's called theory of international politics. Right? He was claiming sort of hegemony in the field. This, this, is the, this is international politics. And it was the first really systematic realist work, I think. Mm -hmm. The great previous realists are, uh, are Morgenthau and E.H. Carr, E.H. Carr earlier than Neither of them are very systematic linker. Both brilliant, I think they say this is brilliant work and one should never underestimate the quality of this kind of realist work. But it wasn't systematic. They didn't try to build it up in a logical way. It was full of insights. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Waltz was the first person, I think, who really has a great contribution, really tried to construct, and he did it in a very arrogant way, I must say, a, uh, a, the, his theory of international. So it became a target challenge. So After Hegemony is a book which is targeted at, at Waltz. Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to show that Waltz is wrong, an attempt to show that, to explain why international institutions exist, which they shouldn't exist in Waltz's theory, and why they are... Um, important and what accounts for them. Mm -hmm. And I said a minute ago that what I uh, identified as a, uh, what I had said it, you have to identify something missing in the theory. And I, after several years of struggling with this, it was a struggle, uh, decided that what Waltz was missing was a theory of information. Mm -hmm. That is, the assumption was implicitly, it was, he never talked about information, but that everybody had information, everybody had full information. And I'd, I, my, my theory, as you know, is based on the argument that, and, and also I was reading a lot of economic history literature, economic uh, uh, structure organization literature, reading about transaction costs, uh, the costs of making agreements and making bargains. And those costs were also not there. Mm -hmm. So I put those two parts together and said, well, look, we have institutions because they're performing a function. That, that was a kind of functional theory that comes out of the work of Ernest Haas and others, who, and David Mitrani, who look at this issue. And it but also came out of economics, which has a, doesn't call it that, but a lot of it is functional theory. Uh, that is, institutions exist to perform certain functions which 
are demanded by powerful actors. So that was the premise, and the premise was therefore that it, and so it had the same premise as realism that it, everybody's behaving self innocently. After Germany's a state centric book, it doesn't talk much about non state actors, unlike the earlier work with, with, with Die. But it says, suppose we just now consider that these states face problems of transactions costs. It's hard for them to make agreements, hard for them to bargain, uh, and they face informational problems. Um, and the, the claim I made was that. Yeah, international institutions reduce transactions costs and provide information. And that's why they exist. And the implication of that argument is that international institutions are unlike what maybe some of the idealists might have thought imposed on states. The states are actually want them. States create them. And that was, of course, the nice thing about that theory is that it was consistent with reality. These institutions weren't imposed on states. The UN wasn't imposed on states. It was built by states and all other international inter, intergovernmental organizations uh, were also. So uh, that, that's, that's the basic. So the argument then tried to bring together both a critique of realism on a theoretical level and also the observations that these institutions were, were important and the institutions were in fact also created by states. You put these three things together and that's where you, where you get after Jimmy's basic theory, which is in, in, in chapters four to six. Um, there's other, other, other material in the book, which is more political economy analysis of the 1970s and 80s, for example, or 60s. And, in the 70s, which was illustrative, and, and but the core of the book is, chap is, is, uh, is chapter one and four to six. Now, chapter seven is the one I'm, the I'm proudest of, though, because it departed, it really anticipated a lot of work later, I think. It departed from the assumption, I used this, the assumption of rationality, which Waltz had also used. He claimed not to, but he really did, mm -hmm. uh, and which was common in the economics literature that I was building on. I use that assumption in the book. So I'm going to build this. I'm not going to I'm not going to claim that there are these institutions exist because there's emotional connection or some other uh, normative. They're, they're rational. They're, they're rationally instrumental for the purposes of states. Um, but then in chapter seven, I say, well, let, let's relax that assumption. We know people are perfectly rational. And I use Herbert Simon's notion of bounded rationality. And if you go, if you look now at behavioral economics, which was founded by two psychologists, actually, Amos mm -hmm. Tversky and, and, and Danny Kahneman, Richard Thaler, one of their colleagues, has just received the Nobel Prize in economics, as Kahneman did earlier, and Tversky would have if he hadn't died first. Um, if you look at that literature, which has become very important, it, it has its roots in Simon. Uh, Simon had the essential insight that you could have a form of rationality that was bounded. In Simon's sense, it was you, you had to take shortcuts. You know you can't work out every detail of something. So at some point, people I'd go to a certain point, and then they then they approximate. They satisfy in Simon's sense. Now the the current theory, Kahneman, Tversky had much more rigorous theory, much more experimental, much better developed, much goes much further. But it goes back to Simon, mm -hmm. uh, and at least in chapter seven, I was I wasn't inventing, I wasn't anticipating <clears throat> Tversky and Kahneman. I wish I had, but um, although I had not, I had read some of Tversky's work, I knew him. Um, but uh, you know, I was going back to back to Simon and the notion of bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. um, before coming to the questions that are coming in right now from from our followers, right. I want to um, to point to something to to some of the things you you just mentioned. You were referring to um, the realists not really caring, for example, for for international students and to be very. Um, American centric then in their interpretation then as well or how can I understand this this notion of um, <clears throat> of being very focused on 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 one interpretation and and narrow idea of, of the world no I don't think they were I don't want to say they're narrow I, I, I don't think they were I mean after all E.H. Carr uh, was British and thoroughly European and he's the first really the first great realist thinker mm -hmm. to uh, to articulate in certain forms, a notion of uh, of states acting according to their notion of their national interests. Um, I think that any uh, theory narrows to some extent. You can't have a theory of everything. It becomes very diffuse. Mm -hmm. So I think that what the realists did and do is catch hold of a very important aspect of world politics, arguably the most important aspect of world politics, the competition among states uh, behaving in a world which is essentially anarchic uh, 
uh, on the basis of their own conception of their interests. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it reified that and objectified the interest too much. It, it, it ignored other, other things. Uh, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think, I wouldn't take narrowness. It, narrowness is, a, is not a, all bad. It does leave openings for others to have other mm -hmm. ideas. But if you, aren't, if, you, if you don't narrow down somewhat, then you don't have a theory at all. So suppose I had built a theory which was not on, it's narrow to take a rational choice approach. That's narrow. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, you may have no theory at all. You may have no conception of how anything happens. And I don't think that these, uh, I don't think the, that the realists were uh, ethnocentrically American in general. Okay. I mean, Waltz, for example, was a early, he was an early critic of U.S. Vietnam policy, mm -hmm. earlier than I was. I mean, Ken, Ken was against it from the start. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't, I don't think, I think they were great power centric. They didn't think that small powers mattered, mm -hmm. uh, and that little, or they didn't think much that developing countries mattered. Mm -hmm. It was a theory of great power politics. I don't think it's American uh, ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. Um, what you're saying right now reminds me a bit of the talk we had two days ago with, um, Amitav Acharya, mm -hmm. um, because he, he also um, has has a very um, deep motivation saying that there is some sort of um, structure in international relations theory that needs to be um, need to be rethought that we need to rethink some of the things um, we are believing in that we need to think more in terms of a global IR uh, instead of um, how IR theory is right now when you talk about hegemony where you talking about how hegemony as a concept in terms of power that you were just talking about was considered or were you also talking about hegemonic discourses in academia was it also an approach to to rethink kind of the the um the way um ir theory was was taught and uh and studied it, it was a former it was really talking about Uh, hegemony as the, as a, as the ability to uh, make the rules for a system and and on the whole enforce them not not totally mm -hmm. and my I, I'm not sure I, I would choose the title again because it sort of placed it in it was an attempt to show that there could be order and cooperation after us mm -hmm. I, I erroneously believe us Germany was coming to an end in the 1980s I didn't anticipate 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was thinking about a lot of people were saying, look, the U.S. hegemony is eroding, and this is going to mean a world of disorder. The realists tended to think that as there would be a, there'd be a new power competition in Gilpin's work. Gilpin's, it's, it's, it's great work, but it takes the view that when you have a competition among uh, between a declining power and a rising power, you're going to have a period of disorder. Um, um, uh, uh, Kennedy, the historian, uh, Kennedy wrote a very popular book in 1988, which had... Uh, a bestseller, which had the same argument uh, that he thought uh, Russia was rising and the U.S. was declining, and mm -hmm. uh, this was going to lead to disorder. And I, what I, what I argued was that even if the U.S. did decline in relative strength, that is after hegemony, there could be a pattern. Of so there was clearly a normative purpose there. You know, don't despair now. Don't just go back into a realist uh, mindset and therefore create the conditions, the conflict that you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. Be aware that you could actually build a world order um, with international cooperation that was in the mutual interest of various countries without having to be dominant. That was the, but the, I, I did, I did read Gramsci and I cited some Gramsci, but the, uh, the book is not about um, hegemonic discourses. And actually I, Don't think I agree with Amitai about that. Mm -hmm. I think that the fact there was a hegemonic discourse, that was the Waltzian realist discourse. And that was important because it was a coherent discourse and you could attack it and you could therefore try to develop an alternative discourse. So I, I, I think there's a lot of huffing and puffing about hegemonic discourse. And I think what people should do is develop a theory, uh, develop a, a better theory mm -hmm. than, than the dominant ones. And uh, I think in general, if it's a better theory, it'll win out. Mm -hmm. So me, Michael Zern has a terrific uh, new book on a theory of, of, of world politics, which is a, the same sort of scope as Waltz's his book and, by, and my book. And he's got a very different argument, um, much more institutional in mind, actually. That's what I think people should be doing. I don't think complaining about heads of my discourse is very helpful. Mm -hmm.
I have some questions, but uh, our viewers uh, back home also have a question, and uh, I want to read out the one uh, by Rian. Rian asks, do you think that in light of recent events between the US, Russia, and China, that the United States may still be able to maintain its hegemonic global power and diminish that of the other two powers? I think you don't want to bracket Russia and China. Uh, Russia is a declining power. Uh, run by a very uh, uh, ambitious autocrat uh, with certain and with certain abilities uh, on, on the internet, for example, and 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 certain degree of unscrupulousness, which gives it a gives it a prominence and willing willing to use force in, against against Ukraine in violation of the norms of the post war system. But it's if you look at power and what Russia's GDP is about the same as California's, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's falling, unlike California. So China is a very different story. So Russia is not a candidate for hegemony. It's not a candidate for challenging hegemony. It's a, it's a nuisance. It's a, it's a nuisance country from the United States' point of view, from the European point of view. Um, it could be dangerous, thanks to a terrible example. They have nuclear weapons and they have an army. So, but they're not a, a, a country you could imagine having a global reach. China is reaching for a global reach. The Belt and Road Initiative is, is uh, one Belt One Road Initiative is is clear that uh, that direction. Uh, China is now the by far the second largest economy by any standard, and will at some point, given its population, become the largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should talk about China. I don't think that the U.S. Uh, can maintain its hegemonic global power. I think that the U.S. current administration is going the wrong direction in most ways for that. Uh, the American first direction and protectionism. Retaliation against China, trying to eliminate, trying to limit China's abuse of the world trading system, which is massive, is something I think the U.S. should have done earlier. So in that respect, I think the Trump administration is right. But you have to distinguish between that and the steel tariffs, that which are going to analyze us on the sheer, sheer protectionism, and most of the Trump policies, which will reduce American power. Mm -hmm. So I think even in an opt, suppose you had an optimal American policy, which was devoted to maintaining American power insofar as possible and, and maintaining alliances, which is a major source of American power, uh, maintaining American soft power, which is, as Joe and I, I'm sure told you, is a major aspect of American power. If you had that sort of administration, which we don't have, even then, the U.S. is not going to maintain its, its hegemonic global power as long as the U.S. economy is growing by two and a half percent and China is growing by six to seven percent. Mm -hmm. um, I want to have, I want to ask you one more question about, about Russia and can you specify why, why you think Russia is a, is a country that is in decline when it comes to power? I think in, in, this, uh, in this regard you may specify a bit what you think power is because okay. in Ru Russia has the big advantage of being perceived as, as a power that is still big in world politics, isn't it? I don't think so, but uh, I go back to the power crisis. I think we think about power, the best work on power is by Stephen Lukes, mm -hmm. in my view. There's, and so power is partly is the ability, is partly the first phase of power is the ability of, uh, to get others to do what they would otherwise not do through some means of changing their incentives. It need not be coercive, it could, it could be a, a promise as well as a threat. Uh, the second means is the ability to change the agenda that, that's, that's, that's being faced. And a third, uh, a, a third one is to change what people themselves want. Uh, and then you could add Susan Strange's notion of structural power, which is the ability to establish situations where uh, others do what you want them to do on their own because they find themselves in a situation where it's in their interest to do so. And her major example was the U.S. dominance of world, world currency, world, world finance in the last uh, quarter of the 20th century. So even China was holding its assets in dollars, for example. So if we take those four aspects of power, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the fir and then uh, the first one, only one aspect of the first one is military coercive as one aspect of traditional power. Another is political economy, for example. Mm -hmm. The Russians are, are weak politically in the political economy. They're, they're the object of sanctions, not the subject of them. So they only, all they have, they have military power, they have some local military dominance, places like, like Ukraine. You know, they have the ability to make a lot of trouble and they have the ability to interfere, it turns out, in Western elections. So uh, with, um, on, on the internet. 
uh, they therefore have the their internet capacity gives them some of the second foreign power agenda trend. They may have actually helped. They may have actually shifted the agenda in American in American politics through this these maneuvers on the internet. Then some of that. Uh, they have uh, very little uh, soft power, very little persuasiveness. They're not seen as an attractive model. Uh, nobody wants to go live in Russia, who doesn't live there now. Uh, and uh, they don't have any structural power because they're in economic terms too weak. Uh, and if I, if you look back at my after Germany discussion, I, I look at the basic roots of the first form of power uh, as the size of your economy, how much, you, how many resources you have, and they're they're small in that respect, or they're medium power. In that respect. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think Russia is not uh, a great power. Mm-hmm. Um, Rian is another. Uh question, but also Fatih, who was a bit uh, earlier. Uh, maybe out of a con- uh, context, but considering the recent development in Syria, could we say that U.S. is rather losing power and playing a role in the decisions made on the future of Syria in comparison to the Russians' position in Jer- Syria? Well, then, in a, a short answer would be yes, the U.S. has almost no influence in Syria right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you can ask two questions about that. One is, Uh, is it in the U.S. interest of influence in Syria? It's not the case that states have an interest necessarily in being as powerful as possible everywhere in the world. My own view is that the U.S. should not, never have invaded Iraq, for example. I think we should be out of, out of Afghanistan. I think we'd be a more powerful country in general if we didn't have any influence in Afghanistan, for example. And I, and so so you can ask, how important is, is Syria? is not very important in the United States. Uh, it's probably unimportant in the United States. Uh, Not having ISIS as a as a as a successful violent movement based in Syria spreading elsewhere is a medium important goal in the United States. That's mm-hmm. a, and the U.S. act act on that basis. But who controls Syria is not very important in the United States. Uh, what we know is, given the attitude toward the U.S. and the Middle East, that no government that's supposed to, that's that's that controls Syria will ever be pro-American. <laughs> If you think that the at the Sunni anti-Assad revolutionaries will be pro-American. You're not looking at any of the literature on anti-Americanism. Mm-hmm. So what, what does the U.S. have at stake in Syria? Ask that question. And in my view, the U.S. has been too inclined in the in post-war period to think it has an interest everywhere. Mm-hmm. I was in a strong opponent early of the Vietnam War. It was a disaster. We didn't have an interest in Vietnam. It didn't matter to the United States who controlled Vietnam. Um, and I don't think it matters much to us who controls Syria. Uh, so I don't see this as, I think the U.S. has obviously botched this policy in Syria. It was inconsistent. It couldn't decide what to do. Uh, Obama had a, had a weak policy and couldn't quite decide either to say it's not important or to, or to intervene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he was wise not to intervene, despite the, the personal cost. I think it, intervening would have just been a, a morass, like, like Vietnam was a morass, like Afghanistan is a morass, like if, thank goodness, the Iraqis threw us out. And force the U.S. to leave with mm-hmm. a large military force in Iraq, or we'd still be there. Yeah. Um, our next question is again from Rian, who asks: Does power have a role in maintaining the status quo in Antarctica? If yes, the what would a realist point of view provide as a solution to effectively exert it over uh, res communis or res nullius? The answer is in general no. I mean. The, Antarctica is the great, great triumph of institutionalism, right? So you have a 1958 treaty which demilitarizes Antarctica. It's been maintained. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, now, probably, I mean, if Antarctica were a crucial resource for anybody, it might have been threatened, but it hasn't been. Uh, it's an area for scientific exploration. And so fortunately, no, in fact, realism is about as irrelevant to Antarctica as it is to anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. It's a nice, nice, there are a few places where... Uh, realism isn't very relevant. Yeah. Um, then we have one question by Kos, who asks, what is the what is the role of the EU? Um, I think referring to the discussion we had um, to American hegemony and decline. How do you think the, the EU finds its new place in in the world right now? Well, this gets us to a general topic, which is, I don't discuss in after Germany, but it's an important mm-hmm. issue which we should have on the table. And that is how much internal coherence does a given state 
or a group of states have. It comes up now because the United States is much less coherent than it used to be. So I think a, a hidden source of, of decline of U.S. power is so much fundamental disagreement in, in the United States about the purpose of American po purpose of politics in the U.S., the purpose of the U.S. in the world. That wasn't the case in the Cold War. There was a lot of consensus. And it was it was taken for granted uh, by analysts, and so therefore it wasn't factored into the argument. But if you ask now, source of Amer uh, source of, of power, one thing you have to put in the, one of the top five is how coherent is the is the country's society? How much does it agree? Mm -hmm. And right now, China is much more coherent. That's it's because they're nationalists, because they're nationalism of powers. This is not necessarily a good thing for the world, but it makes China a more powerful force that there is a powerful nationalism which unites Chinese, mm -hmm. um, which is not true in many countries, right? So um, now the EU is obviously much more fractured than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So this makes it harder for the EU to operate as a force in world politics um, but still, is, it's, it's a major force in world policy. It's the my, most counts, if you count the whole EU, the largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of resources to deal with. But you have 27 countries, you have to get agreement among them. And now, especially with the eastern and southern flanks of the EU having very different views mm -hmm. on, on topics, it's harder to do. So I think, it, and with Britain pulling out, so I think it's clear that EU is potentially, has, has the resource base, to be strong, it is weakening because mm -hmm. of Britain's departure and because of the splits with the East and South and because of populism in major countries, like including Italy and France. So EU is no, no doubt weaker than it was 15 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, it's still a, a potentially potent. And I think that the uh, one of the Russia's weaknesses is that Russia's form of exercising power is is very crude and threatening and it generates counteraction so even the divided eu almost mm -hmm. all those countries threw out russian diplomats after the poisoning of the of the former a former british british spy in in, mm -hmm. in in britain so and 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 russia and eu has imposed sanctions on russia pretty serious sanctions o over ukraine and crimea one of the problems that compare russia and china now see china is going to do much better than Russia because when China exercises power, it does it in a way that gives it, puts it in coalition with, with groups. Mm -hmm. One belt, one road. We'll, we'll build an airport for you. We'll build a railroad. Uh, we'll give you foreign aid. Uh, we're not going to ask that you have human rights respected so you can reinforce your dictatorship and become aligned with us. Uh, or if you're Greece, we'll, we'll give you lots of money and the, and the Germans aren't so you can align yourself a little more 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 toward us. That's a very positive way of using power. When the Russians use power, it tends to be you poison somebody or you interfere with their elections or you attack Crimea. These are actions that generate counteraction. So you, in, in analyzing world politics, you have to ask, is a form of power being exercised by a given entity, does it build, does it tend to build more power or does it tend to generate counteraction? And if you generate counteraction, you may be killing it. You may be actually worse off after you exercise power, after you try to exercise power. Mm -hmm. Or you actually, to be, to be precise, you use force and you don't generate power from it because you have a, a counterreaction. Mm -hmm. um, talking about the European Union um, and looking back at these 20, 30 years, um, from an institutionalist perspective, was there something that the European Union did entirely wrong? Because... Um, there were many actors creating the European Union who were driven by this this notion that oh that we have an alternative to realism we have we have this new form of institutionalism that gives us um, an idea of of a new way of co cooperating um, the how EU, the yeah. EU is an overall it's an enormous success yeah. right so let's start with that it's easy to complain now but for, if you think about Europe in 1945 and what people expected. And you know the realists expected, uh, after 1991, John Mearsheim wrote a famous article saying, back to the future, EU, with, with Russia gone, the EU will fall apart. And without, you, you, you can look it up. Uh, EU will fall apart and there'll be a, a new Europe which will look just like 1914 Europe with, a lot, with alliances, mm -hmm. Germany against France. So it couldn't be more wrong, couldn't have been more wrong, right? Yeah. But that was the conventional realist wisdom. And the, and the Europeans twice, did a brilliant job of, of keeping that from happening. They first in the 1950s and 60s when they built Europe with the coal and steel community, built it up in a functionalist way, which Ernest Haas 
described in the most effective way. And then after the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, uh, when uh, the Germans in particular were willing to take a, lo- a large short-term cost in terms of absorbing East Germany, short-term cost financially and otherwise, in order to build, to build a Europe, uh, and, um, and the British and, the, and the, even under Thatcher and the Germans and the French all pulled together on that. Mm-hmm. Now, those were enormous accomplishments and they should not be underplayed because they weren't automatic. That took a lot of, far, a lot of far-sighted thinking and a lot of difficult political work. And these people are heroes and they should be seen as such. Now, Zern has, I think, the best account of what's happened in the last 15 years uh, in his book. He talks about international institutions, but EU is really the big actor he's really thinking about, I think. Mm-hmm. That is, these institutions became rule-bound, bureaucratic, and they were not linked closely to domestic politics. Now, maybe they couldn't have been. That was an easy course of action. You're going to build Europe, one Europe whole and free. Okay, you build up the bureaucracy. You get more resources to it. You have more rules from the top. Because you can't develop from the bottom because the publics don't care much about Europe. And, and if you build, build from the bottom, you never get anywhere. So you understand why they did it. But what they did was to create a, a more authority for Europe, but less legitimacy for it. And that's their thesis. Mm-hmm. That is, they became more authoritative institutions, but they began legitimacy challenges kept coming up. And so now Europe in fact faces a legitimacy challenge. Uh, and that's the challenge of this, you know, the, if, if there were three crises of European integration, one is the formation. Uh, how do you develop European integration? The second is, what do you do when the whole world is changing around you, giving you opportunities, but also a big risk in 1990 or so. And the third one is now, uh, when you have these legitimacy challenges coming from the right and the left, right? Uh, so you have the two parties that won the Italian elections are on the right and left. They're both anti-European. Yeah. So you, you have a, you, you, it's going to take political, uh, very great political acumen. Not, it won't be done by bureaucrats. That's why it's going to be hard for Europe to do it because they're run by bureaucrats. Take great, great political acumen to figure out how to make um, uh, a united Europe, maybe somewhat less tightly united Europe, uh, acceptable to democratic government. My own view is that the Europe, that Europe is going to have to already doing this. It's going to have to, unfortunately, as it is normally, uh, tighten up immigration. I think immigration has been a crucial factor in the in the attacks on Europe, mm-hmm. and the, and Europe is blamed for massive influxes of Syrian refugees in Germany, for example. And uh, even the most popular politician in German post-war history had to had to had had to back off. Merkel did, as you know. So uh, I think that. We're going to see whether Europe can reconstruct itself politically, and it's not going to look like normatively like all of us would like. It's going to, they're, going to be, they're going to be compromises. Um, we have some more questions. One is from Mayin, um, referring back to your points on China. Mm-hmm. Why do you think China cannot be a hegemon? In the light of it, working towards taking great control and influence over the Asian Pacific region economically, will it turn political anytime soon? Well. I, it's not the case that I think China could not be hegemon. I didn't say that, and I didn't want to imply it. Um, at the moment, there is no, there's a, there's a not, right now, there's a challenge uh, for leadership and for political primacy, and the challenge is between the U.S. and China. Russia's too weak, and Europe is too divided, uh, and to satisfy, uh, basically, status quo in it, uh, to be a to be a part to be a part of this. So China is the challenger of the United States, and I think that we no longer have American hegemony because the U.S. My, my definition does does the hegemon makes is able to make and enforce the rules. It's not true for the United States anymore. Uh, we can't make and enforce the rules in Southeast Asia anymore with the collapse of TPP twelve at least with the U.S. We can't make and enforce the trade rules anymore. Uh, and so if you look, if you compare with, with the, the situation in the 1990s, when the U.S., with its European partners, made and enforced the trade rules of WTO creation mm-hmm. and, and was able to make and enforce geopolitical rules, take NATO expansion. But the U.S. would play hegemonic then with Europe as junior partner. Europe, U.S. cannot do that anymore. And even if we had a rational and mm-hmm. sensible internationalist presidency, we wouldn't have that anymore. So I do think that American hegemony has, 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 has declined. And if you had to date it, uh, 
I would say the invasion of Iraq, mm -hmm. the great disaster, which was premised on an assumption of much more dominance than the U.S. actually had. And the fact that it wasn't able to make and enforce the rules of Iraq, and it had a huge blowback from its allies as well as from the region. Mm -hmm. So, so if, we want to, if you want to date American hegemony, I would say 1947, when the U.S. starts really playing its major mm -hmm. role uh, with, with, with the Marshall Plan to, 19, to 2003. Now, those are all, always arbitrary, but mm -hmm. roughly speaking. So we're no longer in a period of American hegemony. We're not yet in a period of Chinese hegemony. We may not ever be in one, but I wouldn't rule it out. So yeah. uh, unlike the questioner, China does have four times the population of the United States. Uh, and so if China became as wealthy per capita as the United States, mm -hmm. you would have at least the potential, the economic potential to be hegemonic. It's also pursued an extremely clever policy uh, in most respects, not in Southeast Asia because they're, South China Sea policy is like Russia's, it threatens others, and therefore generates coalitions against itself. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam is, would be much more pro-Chinese if the Chinese weren't being so aggressive about the uh, South China Sea. So that, that, that they've, they've followed too, a little too much the hard, hard power line. But One Belt, One Road it seems extremely clever. Mm -hmm. They're willing to, to invest resources in the short term, many of which will be wasted in projects that, that don't work, but they, but they are de devoted to gaining political influence around the world with this, this, this initiative. And so they're, they're a real contender for hegemony. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more question that actually asks, um, asks something you have half answered already, right. which is um, why or how easy it will be for Southeast Asian countries to counterbalance Chinese power. And in this context, it might be interesting to, to also look on, on China's role over time because the, the strategies China applies change. Do you think that, that the, the politics that China is, is pursuing in the South, Southeast China, uh, Chinese Sea um, is changing over time or that they need to change, that they ad need to adapt certain other policies in order to, to fulfill this new role that, that they want to grow into? Well, I'm not a China expert, but I, I observe it pretty closely. And, and what I, Observe is, of course, is China's becoming more authoritarian, mm -hmm. and they are becoming more assertive internationally. No longer is waiting, biding our time. Uh, now it's she is saying we're going to be leap forward in leadership. So they is making no bones about the desire to be uh, a dominant power in the region uh, and to be a major power globally. Uh, so and uh, in it seems to me that where they have pursued it. Most effectively is where they have used their economic resources and their lack of care, caring about democracy to bind themselves to regimes in power uh, and make themselves useful to regimes in whether it's in Asia or Africa or in Southern Europe that are in power, uh, make them use, make a useful bargain that's, that's beneficial to both China and the regime in power. Where they have not done so well is um, uh, uh, is in use, in trying to project military force in the South, South China Sea, uh, blatantly violating international law and 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 and, and the uh, uh, throwing throwing out the um, international court of justice ruling on the South China Sea. Uh, that is a big mistake because that would generate opposition to them. It may be driven by national. So what could the U.S. do? Well. Here we got into domestic politics because from the point of view of U.S. strategy to contain China, that was the TPP. The Transatlantic Partnership was designed geopolitically mm -hmm. to provide incentives to all of China's neighbors to tie themselves closely to the United States and to give them an option as opposed to China. Now, you, re you recall Hillary Clinton denounced the TPP um, when she was running for president. It wasn't just Donald Trump. Uh, because the TPP was premised on a conception of U.S. Uh, primacy hegemony, which we didn't appreciate sufficiently, which was to some extent at the expense of the U.S. working class mm -hmm. because it involved exporting jobs to elsewhere, first to China and then elsewhere, first elsewhere, then to China, then now to the TPP would export jobs to Vietnam and elsewhere. Uh, and that's, that's the quid pro quo for the, for the involvement. And so the losers 
were not American corporations or the American wealthy, they are the American working class. Mm -hmm. And these are people who perceived they were not being benefited and they voted for Trump, mm -hmm. had voted for Obama and, and voted for Trump. So we, we have a, a political issue. So if, if this were, if the world were just geopolitics uh, and were made by states, by states people, male and female, uh, without regard to, to, to domestic politics, the U.S. would have gone forward with, with TPP because it was a clearly clever, a rational strategy for the United States from a political economy point of view. The U.S. didn't go forward for it because of domestic politics. And that gives China a huge advantage, of course. So that, that would have been the most effective way to limit and, uh, Chinese power. And the collapse of, of the TPP is going to accelerate uh, China's rise and make the Belt and Road Initiative um, more effective. There, there are two areas um, of of politics where the U.S. is withdrawing right now. So there has been TPP, but there's also um, the Paris Climate Agreement, and uh, the climate agreement or climate change in politics is what you're working on right now. Can you tell us a bit about this research project? Well, the research project is is with a number of young scholars, all under forty, um, who will we want to understand better the comparative politics of climate change. Mm -hmm. So from a political science point of view, we don't understand very well under what conditions some countries develop strong climate policies and others develop weak weak policies or none at all. What are the institutions? What are the what are the what are the coalitional uh, sources? What are the industrial sources? What are the sources in the in your location in the world political economy that generate stronger or weaker climate policies? And from a from a pure knowledge point of view and political science is kind of a scandal that we can't answer those questions clearly. So this pro this project is has that that design to answer answer those questions. From the point of view, from the policy point of view, I thought about it a lot. I think that um, the the Paris Agreement was a, a, a political success. It was much better than nothing, but it, it didn't solve the problem by any means. Even if it, had been, if, if it were fully implemented, it would have only gone to take us halfway to the two degree goal. And nobody in the right mind believes that international agreements are ever fully, fully implemented in the best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the best guess would have been, suppose the U.S. had been a, had been a supportive administration. The Paris administration, Paris might have taken us uh, down to uh, sort of four degrees as or it would have gotten as a target, which is not, not nearly good enough. And much more would have had to be done. So yeah. Paris was a small step, and Paris was successful symbolically, and because and it got so many signatures, because it was costless for the leaders who signed it. That is, it, they had vague commitments; they could do what they, what they whatever they want to do. They could put these forward as their indicated national commitments. Those could be off in the future. Basically, they could put the somewhat give the give the symbolic benefits themselves, and their successors pay the cost. Mm -hmm. Who could not follow them? What leader would not accept that? So it was clever in the sense that it got everybody on board and it's you know, a sense of momentum and that I'm a great fan of it in that way, but we shouldn't kid ourselves to believe that it would have solved the problem even if Trump hadn't pulled out. Now, Trump, he's declared his intention to pull out, you know, it takes four years to pull out. It was mm -hmm. carefully constructed that way. Uh, but the policies they're following now are, are negative, so that'll make things worse. Um, it'll slow down progress, certainly in the U.S. and probably lead others to maybe somewhat slow down progress themselves. They're not going to pull out of Paris. It's not leading to an unra mm -hmm. to unraveling, but there's a sense in which it's, it takes it takes some of the, of the pressure off. My own view, though, is a little bit counterconventional. is that we never would have gotten there with negotiation uh, because the incentives to states to do a lot about this public goods problem are not very strong, and the incentives to publics in, dem in democracies to support them are even weaker. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the... If you want to be hopeful, and I am in some ways hopeful about climate change, you want to look for disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. I think the answers are not going to come from the intergovernmental negotiations, sad as it is for a for student of international policy to say that. They're going to come from big breakthroughs, which are, you know, we already have huge solar breakthroughs. I don't know if you all know it, but solar prices are one-tenth what they were 10 years ago. One-tenth. Mm -hmm. I mean, solar is cheaper than coal now. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's intermittent, so it's not fair comparison in some ways. But I think, uh, my own view is that it would be irrational for anybody to build a coal plant now. Mm 
with their own money at least unless somebody pays them to do it because they have to, if you have to borrow money and pay it off over 50 years that plan's not going to be economic in 30 years it's going to be so much cheaper to power with solar it's going to be mothball and you're going to go bankrupt so i think we're going to see massive changes in the power sector it's already happening because of, of, of technology and i'm hoping we'll see massive changes in the transportation sector that still remains to be seen but if we get electric trucks as well as cars that are economic in terms of price of building them and mm -hmm. they will be economic in terms of running them for sure um, and you therefore make it uneconomic to build an internal combustion engine that'll bet a huge game changer mm -hmm. uh, so uh, i'm optimistic uh, I, I think the emphasis i would put on climate change is make sure that governments do basic scientific investment and that they have an open market so that new disruptive firms we never heard of before we never heard of google and apple or google 20 years ago right mm -hmm. never heard of face facebook run facebook never heard of it 15 years ago right zuckerberg was at high school or something yeah. uh, so um we should not be too pessimistic about the potential for market economies if the incentives are right to generate huge innovation mm -hmm. and so one thing we shouldn't do is to expect this to be done by a top-down government process they won't do it yeah thank you very much i have uh, one final question that kind of um relates also um to your function as a as a researcher and as a professor in the field for uh for many years um uh some time ago i i read that uh, umberto echo um while he was writing academic articles um purposely um filled in um footnotes that he just made up and invented and so he could uh, track down um how uh other researchers would would block him because it's where to echo who um who wrote this work and um, he wanted to to raise consciousness about about science being um more critical about his analysis and uh, more uh thinking through um for your instead of just believing what others say and also stop to to just take from others um, and make up your own mind um, you think back and and look on your career um, do you think that researchers in the field young researchers and scholars particularly should be more critical should be more challenging or uh, Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. And, and my best students have always been students who challenge my views. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's too much timidity among students. Uh, I think that it's riskier to challenge established views. Mm -hmm. But I if you're going to make a major impact, um, you have to say something which people haven't said before. So I hate articles to start with a huge review literature review. I think it's mostly a waste of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see people have read the literature, but I think you, what you want to see is to identify a puzzle, something that has not been solved. So my puzzle for after Jemmy was, uh, why do institutions exist if, if, if realism is right? Mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some puzzle that is not solved. You have some idea about how to solve the puzzle, call it a theory if you want to. And then you ask, what are the observable implications of that theory? If that theory is right, what would be true empirically? And you go out and look to see if that is true empirically. Um, and just adding a little detail to something else that's being done is not very important. To that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank a you. lot for taking the time. Um, we enjoyed it a lot Thank and you. all questions, our followers. Questions, questions were great. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day and a good stay here at ISA. Thank you.